you can't always keep people based on promoting them by title or pay rise, but you can invest in their skills. And that's a value. That's part of the expense. If you're investing in them as people, both their personal development and their professional development, not just the functional skills that they need to do their role. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers, and leaders. With thanks to our partner Connect Now, Elevate brings you the best tools, thinking, and strategies to elevate your results. To get access to all of Elite Agent's premium resources, including a detailed episode guide for this podcast, visit joineliteagent.com. And for more information about how Connect Now can make moving easier on your clients, visit connectnow.com.au. Here is your host, Samantha McLean. Hey, hey, everyone. It's Sam here. Today, I'm excited to have a special guest with us. He's a highly sought after keynote speaker, educator, and author of the book, Add Value. With over 20 years of experience in sales, leadership, and personal development, some of you in the industry might know him, but if you're going to Elite Retreat this year in July, Mark has made a name for himself by helping people and businesses unlock potential that they didn't even know was there. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. And first of all, in my intro, I just need to check with my guests the research. How did I do on your background? Because 20 years is pretty extensive and we've probably got a lot to talk about. Yeah, we do 25 now, actually. So a cricket score number, quarter of a century now in my field. Plenty to talk about. That's even more. So the first question I just want to ask you is, what inspired you to get involved in leadership coaching and speaking and training? Can you share a little bit about how your career journey has evolved over time? Yeah, I love this question, actually. I don't get asked it often, so I'm glad you have. I stumbled into my field. It found me, or rather my boss in Europe with Kentucky and Travcorp saw it in me. So I'd been working on the road for two years as a leader myself. And she called me in between tours and said, Nate, I want you to be my training manager to develop the leaders. And that was unusual because I'd only done two years on the road. And typically, it would be people with four or five years. I said yes, because it would be fun. And I got to play football against the Florentines running that training. So she leaned over the table, grabbed my arm and said, no, you're going to do it because this is what you need to be doing. You belong to people. And if I fast forward now, 25 years, I'm still in my field. So my first role in learning and development was literally developing leaders. And so my career found me and I've been in it ever since. So you were the original Ted Lasso then. The original what, sorry? The original Ted Lasso, you know, the show on Apple TV, the original leadership coach. He's one of my favorite shows, actually. <laughs> I love that. I've never heard that one. That is brand new. I love that. I'll use that. Definitely. That's cool. If you haven't checked it out, <laughs> checked it out. I think you'd love it. But these days, as I understand, yeah. you've got quite a different approach to speaking and training. And you've got this thing that you now call a cinematic experience, which you're going to treat everyone at Elite Retreat too. Can you tell us a little bit about what that yeah. is? Yeah, sure. This is quarter century in learning and development. You understand that we learn through all our senses, through powerful storytelling, through the visuals that you've been impacted with. It's why we love certain movies or documentaries. There's always that subtle soundtrack playing behind that reinforces the mood. And so when we had COVID and lockdown, I've always used a lot of creativity and a lot of visuals in my presentations and lots of storytelling. But I used that lockdown time to bring that to another level. And that was literally to create end-to-end cinematic keynotes that can be used as either a single or three screen experience. So the minute we do the intro, the reel starts. And then the magic is as a keynote, I'm keeping in pace with this cinematic visual storytelling piece that's happening behind me. But it's fresh, it's innovative, it's different, and it's really designed to impact people on a sensory level, which is what it's doing, you know, and then it's the curation of the stories, the creation of the visuals, the creation of the soundtracks, but they're landing well, you know, it's a new experience for sure. Yeah, because in some cases we have sort of gone past, and I know real estate events usually characterized by a lot of speakers and a lot of information and stuff like that, and it sounds like you really slow things down to allow people to actually really take it in. Yeah, well, it's hitting their senses so they can take it in for sure. And it's done in such a creative way that they, you know, I've been told by organizers that I'm working with that people are literally leaning in because they're really genuinely interested. And the good thing is the keynote as keynotes are designed, you can get people to really anchor to some core themes, but the real work is an adoption of those principles and changing your behavior and putting them into action in your business. 
And so there's things that we always do to help encourage and drive that as well. The fact I've got my own custom built learning management system means we can unlock relevant content, which we're going to be doing for your audience as well, so that they can get access to additional tools to drive those themes for a period of time, because that's what learning any skill is. So it's kind of really provoke the thought, provoke awareness, get people excited and interested and realizing, hey, yeah, this is relevant for me. Now, how can I do it for myself? That's what it's really about. Yeah, because that's what's really important, isn't it? Is not just going to the event, but actually taking the things from the event and taking them home with you in your suitcase and actually unpacking them and implementing and stuff like that. Because we know that one idea implemented well is worth a thousand unimplemented thoughts. Completely. It's the action. You know, it's awesome when you've got keynotes that are entertaining and inspiring and motivational. But beneath that, I would always say actionable what's pragmatic, what's practical, what's actionable, and how can we do something with this for ourselves and our world? Absolutely. So you're going to be talking on the topic of adding value, and I want to get onto that in a little bit of a moment. But seeing as you're so close to helping people and leaders and small businesses and large businesses with leadership, what are some of the current trends or developments that you're seeing shaping leaders right now, and how do you see them evolving over the next few years? Yeah, there's one expression, and I'm sure you would be able to relate to this because it's everywhere, and that is everyone's a leader. And the two or three things that I'm working with most businesses on, actually, this is one of those ones, is leadership development. But that is not just about working with leadership tools relevant for people, leaders, or business owners. It's actually succession planning, developing the people in their business, regardless of whether they have a title or not with the skills of leadership. And it's a smart thing to do because investing in your people is a retention strategy, right? So it doubles up. That's another challenge as businesses are having is attracting and retaining the right talent. Well, guess what? If you've got a really robust development framework where you're investing in skill development in your people, that keeps them there longer anyway. So you're doing a double whammy. You invest in skills that you know they're going to use in your business and you invest in skills that's going to make them interested and keep them there longer. So it's Leadership development for everybody, not just people leaders, is the first part of that, I think. Yeah. I've heard a couple of the coaches say recently that sales is now leadership as well. Like people don't want to be sold to, they want to be led through a process. So can you comment on that? A hundred percent. You know, actually, I'll tell you a short story it makes me think of. And a lot of my stories come from my tour days. I was on a tour years ago, I was in Munich. And we're in a different hotel. And I just naturally started walking down the train station to take my group to a train line. And as I got to the bottom of the escalator, I suddenly realized, damn, I'm on the wrong platform on autopilot. So I turned straight back around and go back up the next elevator. And everybody's just following me blindly. And so I decided to go on this 10-minute rambling just to see if they keep following me. And it really helped me realize that when you've got people that trust you, or if you demonstrate a strong lead, they will follow you. In that. So I'll link this to now what you said. I absolutely talk to this. I train this. Sales is one of those bespoke bodies of work I do with businesses to build their sales methodologies out. And control or leading the sales process is one of those five fundamental sales principles. So 100%, if you can be strong in leading people, you encourage that process to have a better result. I agree with that 100%. Yeah, amazing. And so the world is changing rather rapidly at the moment. It's almost like sometimes I feel the ground shaking beneath me with new AI technology and all sorts of stuff going on in the world that's changing, you know, the way that we do business. What do you think is the most significant challenge facing businesses right now, small or large, and how do you feel it can be addressed? Yeah, you know, and I'll link this. I was actually listening to some of the previous podcasts you've done and one with Jeff, which I thought was very good on exactly this topic, right? And to me, this is the challenge I'm seeing for businesses from my side coming from human behavior. The biggest challenge is how do we actually blend technology with humanity? How do we blend the tech into our business without losing the appropriate human touch? And I'll give you an example. I've written pieces on this. I don't know if you know the app Blinkist. It's an app that abbreviates books. Now, as an author, right, I love it. It's got a place. But as an author, I'm torn, you know, add value. It was. A year writing it, five versions written, months in editing, and you're going to edit something like that to 15 minutes. But we, we blink as things to abbreviate it. But the problem is we're sometimes abbreviating too much. And what could technology can sometimes do is if we don't curate it appropriately enough, we're actually killing that customer experience too, because we're taking out some of the touch points 
that can be emotional value. They can be service value. They can be relationship value. Certainly one of the challenges I see in health businesses with is helping to better understand, yes, we're going to get tech. Yes, we want to automate and be more efficient. But how do we do that and maximize our humanity and the human touch and not lose that as part of it? Yeah, I agree. I think that's going to be the key thing over the next few years is how do you actually lower your cost base with what's coming, but still tell the stories and make the human connections because obviously I can't do that. Absolutely. And it's tempting to do, you know, for years we've been on this roller coaster of tech evolution. So we adopt tech and even tech companies are seeing this. I'm working with tech companies and one of their challenges is actually they're having to sell now what they do. Instead of people buying it because it's tech, they're actually having to understand sales skills to sell it to explain not the widgets and the functions, but the value of that technology. And I think there was something Jeff related to, and I loved as well, and a lot of his conversation is really was talking to being able to better grab data and do something with that. There's a poem that most people know a line from, from the 1830s called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And the line goes, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Now, the current day version of that, I would say, is Data, data everywhere, yet way too much to think. And it's really being able to curate the best data and given us strategies as to what we can do with that and maximize all the other, like as I said before, emotional value, service value, relationship value, and just not let it be data or tech sake. It is exactly like what we were just talking about. There's no point in having all the data in the world if you're not going to do something meaningful with it. Yeah. Exactly. It's curating that data and then strategizing, well, how does this help? You know, what do we do with this information? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about add value because this is a fun topic for me and something that, you know, we deal a lot with in a program that we call Transform. But a few questions about the book to begin with. So first of all, what inspired you to write it? Yeah. Going back now, it must be getting close to 20 years. I was coaching sales leaders and reaching creatively, I started asking those leaders to define value for me. And it was their answers that caught me off guard. Like I went, wow, that's interesting, because a lot of them couldn't even explain it. They didn't even know where to start. And I found that interesting because value underpins, if you think in business, if we're not demonstrating value, people are not going to deal with us. But how can you demonstrate value if you can't even define the word? And that's what sent me down this rabbit hole, if you like, which led to the ultimately became the model, the TED Talk, and then the book, Wiley have taken, and we've published the book globally. So it was that kind of aha moment for me of going, wow, there's a reason this is a powerful conversation, then going down the rabbit hole to better understand it and come out with a framework. It is interesting because we do this program called Transform as well, which is a 30-day challenge. And often a part of it will be like, how do you differentiate yourself? And I read the back page of Add Value, as I always do before a podcast, and it said something about adding value being almost like a hashtag or something like that. What's different about you? Why are you charging more? Well, we provide more value. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's almost become a meme. That's exactly it. Yeah. That was one of the reasons as well, like that hashtag of Add Value. But then what you see that anchored to, it's actually, you know, a selfie is not adding real value when you look at it. You know, it's like it's this meme, an expression that's thrown out randomly. But what's the depth that lives with that? I agree completely. Yeah. So from your personal or professional experiences, and we'll leave some links to your TED Talk in the show notes so that everyone can go and have a look at that because it was 17 very worthwhile minutes for me. Actually, it was 34 because I watched it twice. <laughs> so that's how interesting yes. I found it. But can you give us a, like a practical example of how adding value made a significant difference to you and your business, like true value? Yeah, sure. Well, first one, it's for me and my business, but then certainly with the businesses I'm servicing, if you link back, step back one step, the reason value is so hard for some people to comprehend is because we look at it through our filters, our human behavior, our preferences. So that's why when you ask some people to define value, they're all about the ROI, right? Show me the money, show me the return. Now, that's what I've come to define as the value language of business or tangible value. It's measurable stuff. But then you ask other people to define it, and there's nothing about measurability. And the reason I use the teddy bears in the TED Talk, I won't give too much away. That's why, because for me, that was one of the best examples I've learned that really shows how you can change people's perception to increase their value of something based on nothing more than a beautiful story. And that's emotional value, right? So the starting point, and I bring that to your question, is the value model really helps give a conscious structure to be able to add value holistically 
to all types of people that we're dealing with. So we can actually, what I would say, fill those value buckets up. So that's the first thing. I think it's a really beautiful framework oh, and people enjoy it. It just gives five aspects and they can see where they've got strong and weak areas or where their buckets are heavy and light. So it helps them really come up with better plans of, you know, from sales, from customer experience, even from leadership, adding value for employee experience. It gives them five kind of distinct areas they can think about in a different way. So that's what we're going to be doing at Elite Retreat, isn't it? It was actually giving people a framework, if you like. And I'm really excited about this to actually be able to define the different types of value that they add. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's given them these five buckets and generally then people see it in an instant. You know, they kind of go, yeah, they can see how that's playing out within their business or they see opportunities of where they can improve even some of those that they're strong in. So it's a beautiful takeaway. It's a model with five elements, but then ideas for each of those five elements that's actionable that you can do something with pretty much straight away. And you know, real estate agents, because I know that you've done a bit of work in real estate before. Yeah. How yeah. does that framework lead to the holy grail, which is like more listings or more managements? How can you actually use it to grow your business? Yeah. You know, it's funny because in recent work I did, so no, it doesn't matter which brands or whatever, but we did a workshop and what was curious is they had inside data captured and it was beautiful survey information, like solid data on how did people hear about them? Top 10 reasons. Why did people choose to use that agent? Top 10 reasons. The reason that they're selling, the top 10 reasons. And then I came in and did my session and what became blatantly clear was that the 80 to 90% of those top 10 reasons for each of those three areas was directly correlated to an aspect of value. So I'm going to give you an example. So for example, most important reason for choosing an agent came down for them to the selling price and the fees. Guess what? That's tangible. That's the measurable stuff. Now they can hone in on how can we demonstrate the tangible value that we provide more effectively? How did you hear about us? And bizarre, well, not bizarrely to me, because I find this is the same. Majority of that was still word of mouth, recommendation, heard about you through a third source. And I still have, I'd say still not more than 90% of my business is still that. And guess what? That's relationship value. That's what are we doing to really build out those relationships? The reason for the sale, and that was, as you can imagine, was things like upsizing, downsizing, retirement, deceased estates. And guess what? All of those are problem solving, which as you'll get to understand in the model, is, ser- is one of the dichotomies of service value. So what this did for that, even in that workshop, it gave very specific aspects of value to maximize on at different parts of their sale or different parts of the customer journey relationship. Does that make sense? So that's just one very practical way that you can see it, realize it, and then start to action it more effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is a question that I've been sort of weaving into the podcast lately, because as humans, we're all consumers of real estate. We're all some real estate agents <laughs> customer. Yes. Thinking about some of your own real estate experiences, what are some of the moments where you feel like value could be created? Yeah. And I'll talk to my first hand ones is what always stands out for me is when you've still got that personal touch where you actually feel like it's a personalized approach. And it's the minor simple things like them remembering things from prior conversations that aren't necessarily even about the real estate, the transaction, what we're doing, but just about me in general. So it's those personal touch points are the ones that always spring to mind. And again, I won't, won't matter the name, but one of my friends who have done work with the top percentile in LJ actually, and I remember years ago, I shared this idea and he said, I agree hundred percent. And it was quite simply this handwritten Christmas cards every year still leads to a massive impact to their business. And there's the point, handwritten Christmas card once a year to those client base. So for me, if I was to bucket it, I would say it's those personal touch points, especially in a world of AI and digital, the more that you do those personal touch points on the receiving end of the real estate experience, they tend to stand out more in this day and age. That was going to be the next question I was going to ask you, but you've just (laughs) answered it actually about adding value in the world of technology. But Actually, that's a good question. I can expand on that. There's one line I'll say that kind of ties to what I answered, but still answers this question. Automation is not the same as personalization. And often we confuse the two. Now, you've got CRMs and systems that can send me a dear Mark letter. And with AI and the evolution of that, you can get tech that sends me letters that does so much more than that. But guess what? As a customer, 
I'm more attuned to recognizing where there's automation and tech at play. And actually, as Jeff talked about, when you use it openly and overtly, people know you're using it. So what stands out is where I can see the aspects that has taken more than tech to do, that's the bit that stands out, hence why. So don't think about automation as personalization because it's not. How can you automate and still add an element of personalization would be the tip I'd say there, particularly for real estate. Yeah, absolutely. Because I receive emails from people all the time. And I think it was another podcast guest actually, where somebody sent me an email, which was just like, hey, McLean, here are my latest listings in South Australia. (laughs) You know, like I live on the Gold Coast of Queensland. I responded and said, hi there, my name's Sam. I live on the Gold Coast. I never got a response back. That's the sort of thing we're dealing with. It's great to use the tools, but I think you're absolutely right. It's oh, about no. personalizing the mass communications. <laughs> <laughs> Even as my ex-husband's surname, I, I, it's not something I particularly like. <laughs> I was going to say as well, is that an earned right? Do you actually get called McLean by anybody, right? Is this an earned, you earn the right to call me that in the first place, maybe, you know? <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> So even worse, so that then triggers, that could be a trigger that's even more a negative impact, right? Yeah, that's a great example. But it's that automation just doesn't always work. It can take away from the experience for sure. (laughs) So just one more question on adding value, actually. So we've talked about adding value to customers, but I really think, and you referred to it earlier on in one of your answers, is that there is a war for talent out there, like unemployment is still, you know, like at record lows as we speak. In the context of leadership, how can leaders think about adding value to their teams and create a culture where everyone feels empowered to contribute at their best? I know that's a big question, but if you could give us a bit of a whistle-stop tour. So this culture is actually one of those productions that I've built out, and it's actually one of the four top themes for me that I'm doing work on, as you can imagine. We've actually evolved from the experience economy, but let's just talk the experience economy because this is relevant to this answer. And let's get a context for that, first of all. In the agrarian economy, let's think about a cake. You'd bake your own cake, grow your own goods, bake your own cake. It's a goods economy. You'd buy ingredients for a few cents, add some, you'd bake your own cake. In the service economy, you pay somebody else to do that for you because you're no good at baking cakes. Now the experience economy is, hey, there's a cake as part of the experience, but there's all these other things happening around it. It's not just about the cake anymore. Now, If we take that and think about that with employee experience, because they're in the experience economy, it's not just about the salary, wage, and the job. It's all the other things around it. So some great examples here are, it's the package benefits. It's the things like, you know, Atlassian spring to mind that do this well. They get behind global causes that are big. They pay people full day's work to have that time off to go and support that global cause. That's part of the experience economy. Flexibility, and this is a hot topic. In fact, what employers want their teams coming back full-time to the office or close to. Employees want to work from home more remotely. There's a balance in the middle, but it's creating more flexible environments for people to work, to have that work-life balance they talk about. It's investing in their skills. It's like I said earlier, every business I know, even big ones, they're pyramidical because they're hierarchical. You can only have one CEO. I've worked with one business that had three CEOs and that was messy, right? So you can't always keep people based on promoting them by title or pay rise, but you can invest in their skills. And that's a value. That's part of the experience. If you're investing in them as people, both their personal development and their professional development, not just the functional skills that they need to do their role. So these are just some practical ways of doing it. And there's an interesting fact I'll share as well. And that is that we're now the next generation of employees and the stats are out to show this, they care as much about the impact of the brands that the businesses they work for have on the world than what they get paid in their role. And so what is your purpose? What impact do you have at a grassroots level to community, to society, to the environment? Because people get behind that, including your employees and your talent. So you've got to think about creating these experiences in a whole creative way. So I'm trying to give you a broader answer, but not be too long. (laughs) I'm loving it actually, because one of the other speakers at Elite Retreat, Tim Duggan, his topic is cult status based on a book that he wrote, How to Build a Business People Adore. 
And he says exactly that same thing, you know, think impact first. You know, it's something I'm thinking about a lot at the moment too, you know, like what's the impact yeah. we want to have on the aging community. But I do think that the future belongs to people who do think about what it is first, that they're very clear on what their purpose is beyond making a dollar. Well, people care less about a business being profitable. So yeah, so what? What else? And there's an interest and it makes me think, one of my friends in the US, Latia, she wrote an amazing article, I'll maybe send you a link, how brands can align with the values they're selling. Because a lot of companies, what they do is they jump on the bandwagon of a trending topic or theme, but they're not living it. And if you do that, you actually get pushback when you're busted on it. You can get pushback and you actually it can go backwards. So sometimes it's good to know your vision. It's good to know your values. It's good to be doing these causes, social impact, environment impact, grassroots in the community, but do it authentically. And sometimes the best thing we can do is put our hands up and say, hey, maybe we can do a better job at this. And that's part of the journey. And people will support you when you do that too. You know, So absolutely, this is part of that piece. And I think the culture for me, I kind of come at culture. The starting point for me for culture is, yes, there's organizational business culture with some tools you can work on. But I love coming at it from the ethnological sense. When you understand what bonds people in a tribal sense, you can bring some of those rules into your business and they work like gold, like four categories of traditions, people being aligned with your values, which is a part of this conversation as well. That's part of that. So yeah, super relevant. Yeah. Amazing. Now, you mentioned Blinkist, and one question that I always ask all of our podcast guests is we've already got a ton of links to leave in the show notes for your TED Talk and for the book and for all sorts of other things that we've talked about today. But you mentioned Blinkist, and one question I like to ask everyone is, you know, do you recommend any books or other resources that people might like to come and look up that are your favorites? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of standard books. I love Creative Visualization by Shakti Gawain. I love As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. And then they've even got versions written for our current times because that was written in like 1904. So now it's As a Person Thinketh, you know, to be more inclusive. But if you get over the language and these, I like them because they're small reads that are mindset. They get in your headspace of really understanding that how you think about stuff has a massive impact on how you go into action. And ultimately that leads to your results. So that would be a couple of books straight off the bat. And I dare say I'll share more at the, <laughs> the retreat as well. Yeah, amazing. Well, we are looking forward to seeing you in Bali in July. I believe you've got some travels between now and then. Where is home, by the way? Well, I mean, home now is Australia. You know, Australia is really home. I often joke, you know, it's mangoes don't grow in Edinburgh. So that's why I live in, <laughs> in Australia. So yeah, born in England, raised in Scotland, but now Australia for 22 years. So this is really home. Everywhere else is a trip in between. I'm looking forward to Bali though. I'm super excited. I'm really looking forward to joining you all for the retreat. Me too. Looking forward to escaping that Australian winter. We'll go there and all warm up together. Mark, it's been fantastic having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming along and sharing your wisdom and all of that sort of thing. If there was one main takeaway or message you'd like to leave listeners with, what would it be? Yeah, and I'll say this here and I'll probably repeat it because I don't think I can ever say this enough. If I summarize and think it's how can I genuinely add value today? And that's done by how can I make a measured impact to the world of the people I'm serving? How can I make them feel good about dealing with me? How can I actually have an impact towards some sort of problem that they're experiencing or my community and make a better impact to that? How can I build better quality relationships? What am I doing today to not get sucked into the tech, but make sure I'm keeping my finger on the pulse with a human touch and picking up the phone and speaking to people? And how can I keep improving myself? Because learning is a lifelong journey. We never reach a point where, hey, I'm armed with the skills. I hopefully will be a better version of myself, you know, another five, 10 years, but how can I keep improving myself? If I ask myself those each day, then I know I'm going to do the, walk the talk of add value through the five elements. How can I add value to my world today? Amazing advice. Mark Carter, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Elevate podcast with thanks to connectnow.com.au. Don't forget to get access to all of Elite Agent's premium resources, including a detailed episode guide for this podcast. Visit joineliteagent.com. 